As a quick reminder, if you're here for the first time, uh, the PL Endra's Working Group is a collection of amazing teams across the PL network, um, helping drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. Um, we work across a ton of awesome projects um, that have been spawned from PL over the years, open source communities like IPFS, Lib2P, and Filecoin, but also many more like DRAND, multi-formats, and others. Our mission is to drive breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability, scale network native research and development, and help steward and grow these open source projects and networks. Um, and we have a ton of teams across this working group that are focused on different areas of improving these uh, protocols and ecosystems. And these are the four main things we're focused on for the year. First, stewarding critical growth, um, growing the overall network, um, making sure that we have a robust storage and retrieval system across IPFS and Filecoin, um, and that we bring compute to Filecoin state and data so people can build awesome things on Filecoin. Quick view into some of the, the breakthroughs. We're getting close. This is one of our last all hands of the year since we have these monthly. Um, and we've done a ton of things from shipping Filecoin virtual machine to a lot of work around compute. We have a lot of new retrieval tools. We're going to hear a little bit more about Capoose later today. We've seen a lot of ceiling improvements for adding new capacity to Filecoin, and then lots of fundamental protocol upgrades and network versions along the way. Of the things that remain, we have some exciting work um, happening around IPC, um, helping L2s boot on top of Filecoin. We have some important retrieval work happening, both on the CDN side and retrieval checking side. Um, some really useful work happening kind of at the storage capacity and data onboarding side that we're going to get a deep dive on later today. And then we have some important protocol improvements in Filecoin land landing through the end of the year. And I'll pass it off to Lauren to give us a, a deep dive. We're, we're doing prospective grading of our OKRs. We know we still have a little bit more time um, before we fully grade the end of these, but tell us where we are on critical systems. Thanks, Molly. On critical systems, the improving the IPFS gateway with error codes is complete. Go try your favorite error and get back an error page. Um, retries are still in the works. On the three FIPS to the Filecoin economy, um, there are three in progress with Direct Fill Plus, now renamed Direct Data Onboarding, and Gas Lanes have FIP drafts, and then there's work ongoing with the Batch Balancer. Um, the five community bootstrap nodes is complete, as is the Filecoin chain robustness work. Steve? Great. Yeah, for hyperscaling and accelerating uh, talents and teams on the stack. Uh, yeah, CryptoEcon Log is on track. They do have two paying uh, clients currently, the second one, second one being uh, DRAN. So congrats to them. That's great to see. And on the DRAN front, they've landed two customers, including Proof of Play and SSV.network. And they're finalizing their growth plan and roadmap largely with those uh, crypto econ lab uh, inputs. And they've even been, been accepted here into an acceler uh, accelerator program here in the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest. So yeah, good bonus item for them. On the Healy item, we uh, kind of parked this one. I'm not going to meet the original goal of being able to retrieve or sorry, to be author content from the browser and retrieve it other places without relying on preload nodes or pinning services. We are we want to divert more energy towards the uh, reliable retrieval from the browser rather than the authoring story. And so to, to do that, gonna to give a authoring story, gonna use pinning services. Um, so that that's why this one isn't fully met. And on on the pinning service side, we've gone through all the pinning services and actually haven't found any that work effectively from the browser, although we are in close communication with Scaleway and they're making updates to support this. Um, so we'll be on, it looks like we'll be on track to hopefully hit that adjusted goal by the end of uh, by the end of the month, but this was a significant goalpost change, which is why we're marking this as orange. Awesome. Thanks, passing um, Matthew, Yeah, thanks. Matthew's in transit today, so jumping in for his items. Um, in terms of onboarding third-party integration partners for Project Motion, um, Project Motion Alpha is on track for the end of the quarter, but I think third-party integrations might be coming a little bit after that. So um, yellow, TBD, we'll see. Um, for unsealing fixtures, um, those are on the 1.23.4 train, so uh, landed and working on getting out into a release near you, um, but a little bit more um, work required for the redundant window post um, testing and improvements um, there that uh, that we would like to see land before we call this green. Um, on the Saturn side, um, we're not 
on track to hit our goal by the end of Q3, AKA in the next two weeks. Um, we're still working on uh, getting uh, our broad traffic flowing through our, our new Saturn nodes, um, but some new improvements to share uh, in this call on tracing that can help us get uh, that to that goal. Um, and so we're, we're tentatively hopeful that we'll be pushing this back to no later than lab week. Um, and then finally on the dot storage side, um, already got all of the things needed around um, time to deal for future data and a strong spade integration, um, but W3UP is still um, rolling out uh, in terms of getting data onboarded uh, back into the system historically. So we have a little bit more work to do there to um, fully call the screen. Hi, Sumi. Hi, everyone. On upgrading Filecoin with new L2 capabilities, uh, starting with FVM, I will dive into more details during our spotlight. FVM just marked six month anniversary last week and we have great milestones. Um, but on the first line, um, we reached uh, like all the goals, like some of them missing slightly, but we still have uh, two weeks left. Uh, we are rather than 15 million TVL. We are now around 22 million TVL on DeFi Lama, which is great, greatly exceeding the, our goal that we had. In terms of wallets, we reached to 630,000 wallets um, as of this, over 630,000 wallets as of this morning. And in terms of unique contracts, we are almost at 2,000 unique contracts, which is slightly below the goal that we had put. And on new, new FVM capabilities, we are below the end-to-end -end aggregators. Um, it was an ambitious goal. We have one lighthouse working uh, very well right now, and we have multiple conversations to, uh, with multiple aggregators to minimize um, um, to, to minimize dependency to one aggregator. Uh, in terms of storage deals, uh, we are almost 2,000 storage deals as of today. And um, looking at the technical platform side, all of our epic, uh, epics for foundational changes and related FIPS were deployed before the last call for this uh, uh, upgrade. Uh, kudos to our engineering team. It was a very tight deadline. Uh, and we are on track uh, in Q4 to bring uh, non-malicious uh, runtimes. There is more on this. Uh, please come and find us in Iceland um, for FVM and runtimes track. Um, you will have a chance to learn a lot more about what we are planning to do in the coming quarters and be part of the discussion uh, to join us. Uh, on the IPC land, uh, I think Molly, Molly also touched on earlier, lots of exciting things are happening. The reason that we are orange for the Q4 GA, um, we prioritize some of the DX developments moving uh, from M3 to M2.5. So it was a conscious decision that caused delay in certain aspects for uh, uh, GA implementation. Um, on the other hand, for the prominent early uh, users, uh, we are in conversations uh, with um, lots of teams and getting feedback from them. So we are hoping that uh, um, that is going to be reached uh, by like end of quarter, early Q4. And lastly, uh, CAD testnet deployed. Uh, we didn't reach to growth trajectory for the users. Uh, that was mainly because technical aspects of uh, moving to Go was prioritized and that was a deprioritization in getting users. However, we will still uh, planning to, we will we see that we are ending the quarter over 500 executions and 100 total unique external users. Awesome. Well, a lot of great progress and we'll finish grading these for um, next time once we have officially hit the end of the quarter. And with that, I'll pass off to IPFS. Yeah, great. So with IPFS, we're working to make the web work more peer-to-peer -peer with content addressing so content can be verified independent of the provider or the transport method. Um, so yeah, looking at our metrics here, um, you know, no major callouts we want to, to make. Um, yeah, there are, we have tracking items to expand some of this, but again, we're looking at the you know, public PhD, which again, we, as mentioned earlier, is now calling Amino. So we'll use that word going forward. Um, we're looking at the size there and some of our GitHub activity and also the latency across different content routing systems like Amino and uh, Sid uh, contact. Can you go to the next slide? Some, in terms of some of the updates, uh, there's a new Kubo release that will be shipping, or RC, I should say, they'll be shipping in the day today and then the release itself happening next week. But the uh, routing v1 HTTP delegated uh, endpoint 
um, that's been getting specked out over the last number of months, uh, the, uh, asked, adding extra aspects for um, delegated routing, like peer routing, et cetera, have now landed in, in Kubo after going through the spec process. Uh, there was some you know, research that was done uh, in terms of how we could reduce secondary DHT lookups that, are, that were done by ProBlab, and those are now making their way into production. And you'll be able to track the uh, latency improvements from that with a link there. Um, the Trustless Gateway API that has been getting a lot of work across multiple teams, that is now being exposed in Kubo using the new uh, libp2p HTTP functionality. Uh, that's an experimental feature flag uh, in Golib P2P, and also now um, you can use it within Kubo uh, as an experimental feature. And maybe a call out for folks is that the MPLEX is like you know is deprecated. We are not enabling it by default, uh, and in future releases we'll actually just remove it entirely. Um, but that should be good for the for the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, and final release, like I said, will be next week. Uh, more to come about IPFS Companion in the spotlight. So I won't say anything there. Uh, Healy has done work to allow remote pinning support. As I mentioned, you know, we're actually not finding great providers that work from within the browser, but the, the code to verify that and test this out is, is now in place. Um, and so, you know, continuing to work on more onboarding examples and doing, getting into the cadence of producing monthly project reports, uh, looking at who our consumers are, new projects that have been emerging, et cetera. So we published the second one of those. And uh, you know, so behind the scenes, we're cleaning up uh, IPNS v2, having v2 only records that has uh, landed in both Go and JS implementations. So uh, things that are coming, you know, the, the, this group of people is actively working on how we diversify our funding, uh, you know, for the future, and we need to, you know, we're working on those funding sources and talking about the community with that. So that'll be coming up. Uh, the like I said, we're putting a lot of our effort into having reliable retrieval from the browser. Uh, even having an aspect of Helia being able to fall back to using the HTTP trustless gateway um, when other peer-to-peer -peer methods aren't aren't working, and then, and then with that having a way where we can continuously monitor how are we doing with improving um, that our, our reliability. So that that's coming, and uh, work on the gateway dash uh, conformance suite so that we have good dashboards to so showing how different implementations and gateway uh, instances are actually performing in the wild it will be coming. We're also going doing more cleanup of things that haven't been well specified or haven't had corresponding compliance tests. Next up is Unix FS, so more to report there. And uh, viewing IPFS.io gateway as a proper public utility, getting a landing page in place for that and other ways that we can further reduce the cost of that fleet by right sizing and request throttling. So more to share hopefully in, in next month's all hands. And there's some things happening in DHT side as well, but those will get covered in a spotlight as well. So I'll, I'll pause. Thanks, on to the P2P. Yeah, so uh, the libp2p project is a is de dedicated to a set of stacks or a set of specifications for a modular network library with implementations in many languages, so that it's usable in as many computing environments as possible. Um, updates on the KPIs for the community. What we're seeing is we are continuing to grow slowly. Uh, numbers of contributors tend to are, are slowly picking up across all projects, all across all implementations, even though we're sitting seeing uh, mixed counts on individual projects, some going up, some going down. Um, our statistics around the number of peers in the networks have stabilized since the changes that happened earlier this year in May. Um, and we're hoping to see those numbers up uh, tick upward as we engage further in our KPI refinement. Next slide, please. A um, couple of really important call outs here. libp2p plus HTTP has landed in Go libp2p, which uh, brings HTTP semantics as well as HTTP transport uh, to that library. There is an associated blog post on it that just went out this morning, I believe. And that mo there's more um, to come around that as we talk about other uh, implementations adapting it. Other really important things, uh, let's see here. The Rust lib P2P stable release with quick support went out. And we also now have the Ethereum Beacon chain uh, landed experimental support for the quick transport. Um, there were some changes in crypto TLS with quick go that also landed. There's an associated blog post. And then what's coming up is WebRTC private to private is being worked on right now so that we can further elevate the browser itself to being a first-class citizen in peer-to-peer -peer networks and having support in other 
uh, implementations such as Go and also Autonet V2. Um, hopefully we'll have more exciting things in the next uh, all hands. I'll hand it over to Filecoin next. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Filecoin, <laughs> we are here to build a crypto-backed, uh, decentralized, efficient, robust foundation for humanities information. Next slide. Every time I say that, say the Filecoin mission, like what does decentralized, robust foundation mean to me is from a tech perspective, it's really, really clear. But like sometimes I pause and be like, yeah, what is like humanities information? I have a question mark on that. And at the Field Dev Summit in Singapore, uh, Huang actually did a great talk to refresh Falcon's mission. He explained what is actually, what do we mean by humanities information? So obviously everywhere I know we want to support like public good and data, all the scientific papers, historical like press and so on and so forth. However, humanities information is really the union of all the humanities data. So like, you know, my cat's photo is as variable as like, you know, some history in some places, in my humble opinion. Uh, so like all those are considered anything that's, any data that's generated by, by humanities is humanities information and the Falcon ESD decentralized uh, storage network for that. The talk is quite refreshing. Uh, I linked I have a link in this slide. So I would recommend everyone to, uh, to, take, a, to take a look at that. Uh, next slide. So quickly on to Falcon KPIs. Uh, we are still uh, a little bit over 10 exabytes of like robot power uh, on the network. Uh, we didn't store more data uh, on Falcon compared to like a month ago. However, our data onboarding is not slowing down. We're still at like 1.5 exabytes, but mostly it's because we have some old data stored on Falcon uh, from like slingshot, like early network time are expiring. That's why we are not seeing an increase in the total data stored. However, we are not slowing down on storing new data. And the next thing Asun has already mentioned, it's very exciting. We have hit over like 10 million fill, uh, like managed deposit in uh, FEM based smart contracts. And um, just like the other day, like last week in Singapore, we were celebrating it live. It's very amazing how we achieved that in six months. Uh, kudos to all the DeFi teams and Ashrons, um, Long Fei, Sarah, Matt, everyone that involved in this whole effort. Uh, next slide. Some highlights uh, update, uh, Lotus V124.5 RC1 is out, a uh, search provider who has facing unsealing bugs. Those are fixed, and now you can actually unseal the data on the server retrievals. We also finally ship FRC0051 uh, EC broadcasting uh, FRC, uh, which is a piece of work by, done by Consensus Lab over over months, and we just did, did the implementation. Uh, so before, uh, so if you have about more than 20% of the storage power of the network, you can potentially attack the network in a way. However, now that merging is now raised to over, uh, to over 44% which is like a, a huge improvement. The code needs to be carefully tested. It's a little bit scary, but thanks for a huge, a, a huge for implementing this as step and guy uh, from like CL team for carefully review the code for us. And also I just learned Australian Cardiac Institute is actually storing their data on Filecoin, which is like quite awesome. Humanities information, one more on Falcoin. That's cool. So Field Dev Summit in Singapore has wrapped up. We are going to Iceland next week. Uh, Molly is going to do a recap from Singapore. I'm super looking forward to Iceland to continue and dig deeper. In Molly looks shocked, <laughs> but <laughs> I assume. Uh, but like Iceland is going to be awesome. We are actually going to do more deep uh, conversations. Uh, on solutions like workshops, and we're starting to talk about retrieval incentives, uh, more data, client data onboarding toolings, uh, and FEM and runtime and uh, scalability and computations. So if you're in Singapore, stay tuned. If you're not, we're also going to do public uh, community forum and thread, Twitter, and so on and so forth for you to follow along. Uh, and also recording for Field Dev Summit in Singapore is coming up, so, so stay tuned. Uh, NV21 Watermelon is coming. We have scope finalized. Ayushi is going to give you a spotlight later on. And 
I think someone already mentioned that uh, we almost launched the Falcon Rust API, not Rust API, REST API. <laughs> Sorry about the typo, uh, but that's also very exciting. That being said, a lot of fun in Singapore, but also a lot of hard work exposed a lot of challenges and opportunities for Falcon to evolve. Uh, high level things were including fast finality, fast work time so that we can get fast retrieval better sealing data onboarding pipeline. We want to build more allocators for file queen plus data cap so we can get the data in the network. We want to reduce file queen plus abuse. Um, a lot of interesting conversation about flexible sector commitment and, and like updatable sector con content. So you can only, you can seal the sector once but putting new data into the sector. Very interesting conversation on what kind of the deal abstractions file queen needs. Uh, how can we build better storage on ramps? How can we improve client onboarding experiences? Uh, how can we build a sound file queen economy? All those are challenges, but also opportunities for us. That's it. Awesome. Now into our spotlights. Please, everyone keep to one minute so we can spend our time on our deep dives. First to companion. Hey, <clears throat> hey everyone. Um... I'm presenting IPFS Companion. IPFS Companion, for those who don't know, is the best way to interact with your local um, Kubo node. Basically, any IPFS implementation would work. Um, but um, it's a browser extension, uh, which sees 60,000 monthly active users. And recently, it has been transitioned to MV3. MV3 is just short for Manifest V3. Um, this is the new standard for browser extension. The original proposal goes back all the way in 2018, and it was landed as an issue in January 2019. Um, now the transition has completed. The release is going out today, and um, hopefully it will be approved by Google and other web stores um, so that it is automatically shipped to your browsers as soon as possible. Uh, if you don't already have Companion installed, please go there and install it and report any issues if you find any. Uh, the benefits of this new release will be improved performance and re responsiveness. That's one of the issues we have been listening to from the community. Um, but the new way of like defining rules makes it faster. Um, there is better resource utilization uh, where the service worker and the background actually goes to sleep when it's not in use. So that doesn't consume all of your power while running in the background. And we also have new enhanced metrics. Eventually, this MV3 release will transition into extension support for phones. Firefox is already testing that out in beta. So eventually, we'll have access to um, like IPFS implementation in the browsers <laughs> on the phones. So that would be nice. Um, for the future, we are working towards embedding uh, Helia in um, IPFS Companion. And watch out for more updates in the future. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Crypto Econ Lab. Hi, um, so very quickly, I'm going to talk about a project that we did with Credo Network. So they were going through a transition phase in terms of their utility and tokenomics, and they um, reached out to us to help, um, for us to help them redefine um, their tokenomics. Um, and so we had, we essentially the two main things. So first we propose a new set of tokenomic mechanisms, in particular two new fee models um, and a staking model to support um, the introduction of a, a proof of stake system. Um, and then we also created a bespoke model, um, which we named Mecha Credo, that allow us to test, analyze and fine tune the parameters of their economy. And we did a, a set of analysis with this model. Um, so I cannot go into a lot of detail, but if you are curious and you want to learn more about this project, I leave here the link to the Medium post and also to the full set of reports, which go quite deep into each of these things. And if you are curious and want to, to, to learn more about this, or if you are in need of this type of analysis and support, reach out to, to me uh, or uh, to Crypto Econ Lab in general. Thank you. Awesome. Great, great example of helping boot really well-tuned economies that can be sustainable long into the future. So excited for Credo. Ayush, tell us about NV21. Uh, hey folks, a uh, quick NV21 update that I wanted to provide. Um, 
uh, covering essentially what's in the upgrade, what's not in the upgrade, uh, and when to expect this. Uh, so stuff that we have in NV21, this will be our first upgrade in about six months, which is the longest we've gone between upgrades for a little while. Uh, but we're expecting um, the Phil Crypto uh, team has a synthetic pull up, which is just a lighter weight proof of replication uh, that uh, simplifies the overall sealing process uh, for miners that is, that's expected to go live uh, in this network upgrade. There's been a few months in the work. Uh, the FVM has four changes that basically improve and harden uh, the Filecoin virtual machine. A lot of this work kind of falls into the categories of stuff that was important for security reasons, but were descoped from the original, from the FEVM upgrade earlier this year because it was safe enough to ship, but we still wanted to go back and uh, robustify this. Uh, also, a lot of this paves the path towards so-called native actors or native WASM actors, um, which were uh, which is on the FVM team's roadmap. Um, we have a FIP that was that originated outside of Entrez, which is exciting, uh, that allows storage providers to move partitions between deadlines. Um, and this is one that uh, just allows for greater configurability in storage writer operations, uh, as well as some protocol bug fixes and improvements. Uh, things that are not in it, the direct data onboarding FIP that was uh, in work has been discovered from this upgrade, uh, as has a switch to the new DRAN network, both of which we're expecting in NB22 now. Uh, and dates, uh, calibration testnet upgrades October 10th, mainnet upgrades November November 7th. Um, and I do want to call out a risk here, which is that November 7th deadline is very close to lab week. Uh, US Thanksgiving is a couple of weeks later, which um, makes uh, planning a little difficult. We need to be very careful about slippages, especially given that there's traveling in the next week uh, at Iceland and Phil Vegas coming up as well. So at least the, the Phil Dev team is definitely working to try and make sure that we have all of our planning accommodating for that, uh, because a risk, uh, a slippage would be a little difficult to organize here. Um, so yeah, uh, stay tuned for more. And uh, if you are on a team that actively supports network upgrades, whether that's infrastructure or monitoring, uh, uh, this is uh, we're getting into that uh, rollout phase. Thanks. Awesome, exciting, coming soon. Hi soon. Let's celebrate FEM. Yeah, hi everyone. So FEM, as I mentioned earlier, marked six month anniversary last week. And also, here's a tweet uh, from TLDR. Feel free to show your love retweet, comment, like it. Um, so just going over some of the details here, uh, I mentioned field deposits earlier uh, and the OKRs. Uh, just to touch on a little why we think this is an important milestone for us, 10 million as of this morning, at over like 10.5 million uh, right now, as you see on the left-hand side from our starboard publicly available chart too. This metric is important because this is, not only showing that FVM and smart contracts deployments are being used and DeFi is growing, but also this is how our SPs have access to pull, pull off pill, fill being state and that they can borrow. And you can see the fill borrow 7.7 .7 million, almost 8 million. That's a very important metric too. And we almost always expect there's going to be that lag between those two metrics, uh, both from a time lag, but also for our protocols, uh, DeFi staking protocols, them having collaterals, uh, keeping some portion of the fill before that's being borrowed by storage providers. Uh, but this is a very important um, milestone for us because this shows that we are still increasing in our hyper growth phase and we are very excited to see how like fall is gonna unfold uh, for us uh, as a FEM a platform on uh, DeFi land. A few other metrics, DeFi Llama TVL has been a big important metric that we've been following because it shows uh, Falcoin and our platform as, as compared to across all chains. So we are uh, uh, we are ranked in uh, um, 29, but this number sometimes like shifts. You might see us like from 29 to 31, 32. Our goal was being top 30, which is a great success because as you know, this ranking also depends on the price, which we have no control and nothing that we are influencing. So despite everything going on, uh, that shows our growth uh, in terms of usage. Lastly, I also want to touch on our users' contracts deployed. We are almost at 2,000 contracts smart, smart contracts deployed and 200 teams building on FEM, which is super critical. And this 200 number, we have a very high bar for that. It, it's not only any project using FEM, but really teams uh, either got funded by us, PL, uh, or have funding enough, like building serious projects and uh, platforms products on FEM. This also shows um, a great usability for our platform. Lastly, I also want to mention, as you see uh, on the bottom right, 
uh, total wallet size. This was a metric that we felt that we've been uh, we needed to improve much more when we were barely reaching to 150k last quarter, and this quarter, thanks to also DeFi improvements uh, and other use cases, we are now over like 630,000 wallets. With that, yeah, uh, I want to I want to say lastly, Ayush already touched upon improvements done on our uh, platform with uh, the current network upgrade and mentioned the NATO actors coming. I want to highlight again, come and find us in Iceland for FEM tracks, be part of the conversation and discussion, share your feedback, share your great ideas. Uh, there is a lot coming in Q4 and Q1. Awesome, great time for all of those 200 plus teams to keep making the FEM platform and runtime better for their needs as well. So awesome opportunity. Will, tell us about the new Raya tracing. Sure. Um, so this is a cross-team effort. This uh, flame diagram that you see is on Honeycomb and is actually something that can get generated by any Boxo implementation. Um, but the uh, Bifrost Gateway one uh, is extending the tracing IDs back through Saturn so that we can also connect it with the uh, subspans that come from those Saturn nodes and all the way back. Um, if you go to the next one, uh, you will, the next slide, you'll see uh, that we're also getting some of these flame graphs on the specific request in the browser. So every time you access um, a URL from the Saturn uh, variant of the gateway, you can actually uh, get some timing uh, information about the specific request back. And that's something that we can share in band with any client. Uh, and so you can see here that this retrieval actually came through BitSwap, for instance, and, and you can see how long it takes for things like Lassie to do their parts of the work. Uh, and so this, this set of timing breakdowns, uh, along with the more detailed set of uh, labels and uh, the ability to do analysis in Honeycomb, uh, are giving us a lot more visibility into what's happening uh, both in type of Saturn uh, and then providing it as a, as a service from Saturn uh, to its users. Cool. Super useful. Um, and I'm sure this uh, stacks with the Caboose improvements as well to keep making um, Saturn and Rhea better. Amin, you want to tell us what's new in Caboose? So uh, first, just going to recall what Caboose is to make sure we're aligned on, on which Caboose we're talking about here. So um, Caboose is a block store for car files, and in Saturn, we use it as uh, the primary client for Project Korea. So eventually, at some point, all the requests that hit Outcast.io, Caboose will be the client talking to Saturn to solve those, those requests. And uh, one of the core functions of Caboose is optimizing which nodes to select and continuously maintaining an active pool of the best nodes uh, to talk to. And the big update here is that uh, we're working on a new adaptive algorithm for Caboose pool management, thanks to some of the amazing work done by uh, Will and Arsh. Uh, so to briefly explain this update, there's like two big parts to it. Um, first is that we're changing the Caboose pool to be dynamic instead of fixed. So that means that as long as certain nodes meet the performance criteria as we define, it can participate as part of the pool. Um, and that is currently done and going to production. Um, the second and next step targets how much load hits, hits each node. Um, so previously, we uniformly distributed the sit, the sit space amongst uh, the nodes in, in the pool, which implicitly evenly distributes the requests that, that hit each node. And uh, we really want to allow each node to become its true self. So now we consider each node's uh, load capacity to how much how much of the sit space it occupies. Uh, so if you look at the diagram on the right, uh, basically the nodes with larger capacity were, would occupy more of the sit space and hence receive more requests. Um, and yeah, just like really putting it into simple terms, but Caboose is really the glue between two really large systems. So there's a lot of work and testing that goes into implementing changes like this. Uh, so again, thanks to, to Will and Arsh. So yeah, we're expecting these changes to maintain a more optimized node pool and hence like really improve the, the retrieval performance. And uh, that's it, thanks. Awesome, excited to see how, how that performs um, using all of these tracing metrics uh, to see how it goes. Gui, tell us more about Amino DHT. Yeah, sure, so I'm happy to announce that the public IPFS DHT finally has a name, Amino. And like amino acid in biology, we believe that uh, amino DHT was, will serve as a building block uh, for larger and stronger systems. Um, so at ProBlab, we've also been working on um, modernizing the code DHT implementation. 
So this refactor solves multiple longstanding issues and enables easier participation from new contributors. Um, it also makes possible uh, impactful future changes, um, such as a massive optimization for the reprovide process, um, as well as the reader privacy upgrade, uh, also known as uh, double hashing. Um, Dennis built a new bootstrapper monitor monitoring tool, Bumo, and Bumo already uncovered bootstrapper failure both in Amino DHT and Filecoin, as well as a bug in Golly P2P. So it's been out for two weeks and we already got great results. So uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, we, uh, so ProBlob also built a new uh, DHT bootstrapper that's based on the refactor DHT Go code. Um, and it's good because it will offer uh, more diversity to Amino DHT bootstrappers that have been facing challenges uh, lately. So that's it for ProLab. And I guess next is the deep dives. Awesome. We have two deep dives, um, starting first with Project Motion. Awesome. Hey, everybody. I'm Xilin. Uh, so today I'm very excited to talk about Project Motion, which is a cross team effort uh, with the hope to simplify the process of data onboarding. So next, before I dive into project motion, let's start with why we built it in the first place. As we know, get your large data to a Filecoin network is not a trivial task. It has many steps involved from data extraction, data preparation, data making transfer, and uh, data management. So you may wonder, how can we simplify it? So motion is that uh, it's one of the effort to just uh, simplify the process and just do that. Next, uh, what is exactly motion? It's a software integration and orchestration layer between the traditional uh, data storage solutions and Filecoin. Essentially, uh, it uh, aims to abstract away the complexity involved in those operations that you just saw. And this API will be used by SV to store and retrieve data from Filecoin and track verify the status of data being stored. Um, so now next, uh, we'll, I want to briefly touch on who Motion for. Motion is targeted, uh, the primary user of Motion is independent software vendor who act as the middle layer between uh, the large data clients and storage providers. Those ISV may already have backup solutions to different clouds or on-prem storage and are looking to add additional storage layers on Filecoin to attract their uh, more clients. So uh, this, uh, the, although it didn't directly touch uh, the client, but it benefit client by providing that simplified solutions. It also benefits storage providers who want to charge, uh, you know, uh, charge a fee, get some paid deal from clients. So it basically benefit all three uh, personas you just saw here. And next, I uh, want to briefly touch on why use motion. So unlike the other native solutions in the market, the pr pr proprietary mar uh, solutions, motion is completely open source. And it's a uh, one-stop solutions that have abstract away the Filecoin specific uh, internal steps. And uh, the knowledge of Filecoin uh, stack required for you is minimum. And it also um, aim to support large data flow uh, with ease. And next, I uh, want to talk about how does motion works. So motion operates through what we call a motion engine, which ISV can run, uh, which ISV run in data center or cloud. It's deployable uh, view Docker and it's designed to support large amount of data. So the engine use uh, the existing tools like singularities, who is a, a great tool for data preparation. It also leveraged the DR making module from then. And for the retrieval part, uh, we leveraged the last C, the, the library for, for that. So all, all in, basically provide that all-in-one interface that, uh, that, that for you. And when an API call is made, the motion package send the data off to storage providers. So that's the current design. And next, I want to talk about uh, what, what, what are the works that we have done so far. Uh, kudos to the amazing um, engineers who work hard on this, like uh, Xin'an, Hana, 
well, uh, well uh, Marcy and uh, Alejandro, they all made great contribution to this. So right now we are on track to our alpha release. Uh, we now have a motion testable API, have S3 connectors that is under ISV testing. And we also have a end-to-end -end data preparation and deal making flow that is ready to test. So uh, if you are interested, uh, later I, I have a GitHub uh, repo that have all our roadmap and uh, upcoming features. So we are also set for the uh, beta release, which come uh, later around lab week, mid November. So we will add additional features like re uh, partial retrieval, robust retrieval, support for larger data uploads and got a plan for payment. So um, next. Yeah, call to action. So if you are interested in what we uh, currently already been uh, the, the public roadmap and test instructions for the things that we already uh, released, like S3 connectors, feel free to scan this QR code and also check out our public open uh, GitHub repo. Uh, GitHub repo. Uh, also, uh, there is an ask for the community who is watching this video, uh, uh, join our private beta program to get to be the first one in the line to get our latest update. And if you are SP, we would love you to participate us and give us your great feedback. So that's all. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Elaine. Super, super awesome to see motion coming together. Um, I'm going to give a super quick update on the Phil Dev Summit for anyone who wasn't able to join us in Singapore. It was an awesome gathering. We had tracks from um, down to the core protocol upgrades and evolution to boosting SP business success to scaling Filecoin with IPC now and in the future and many others. Um, lots of amazing talks and discussions and um, workshops uh, to, to work on new ideas together. Some pretty exciting ones. Um, here's a quick summary of some of the learnings and takeaways from each of the tracks in Singapore in the protocol evolution track. Um, there's a lot of talk about fast finality and how that's super important for pretty much everyone who wants to be working with Filecoin today. So nudge, nudge, this is a, a top priority for many groups as we look into um, Q4 and our next network upgrade. There were some really interesting designs around a time stamping chain, which could allow us to have a much faster, lighter weight PO rep, much faster, lighter weight retrieval. Um, and we have a design that we're going to keep working on in Iceland. So pretty exciting ideas there um, that could also have effect, effect of a much faster block time um, for Falcon as well. Um, we talked about deal abstractions um, and how changing them is definitely an expensive cost for all of the people who integrate um, and you know look at uh, chain metrics and other things. And we described the concept of sparkling data, which is data that doesn't live within a deal, but might live within a sector, which is okay, but we want to minimize our uh, um, you know, sparkling data that's floating around that's hard to introspect and uh, keep onboarded and useful for folks. Um, and we also had lots of interesting ideas about how we can make the Falcon protocol much more lightweight and efficient um, through decoupling sector commitments from data commitments, um, and maybe not even having deal sectors and just trying to um, you know, really simplify and reduce the complexity around um, onboarding a committed capacity sector uh, and then adding data into existing sectors. Um, so that the whole protocol could be um, more efficient and incentive aligned. So some really interesting ideas there. That's just a tease. Um, feel free to go in and dive deeper into um, the recap track to get an even deeper dive from Nicola. Um, for scaling data onboarding, we talked a lot about motion and there was some kind of initial early feedback and um, data points coming from the local um, storage provider community there. Also some really interesting conversations between Singularity and Lighthouse um, about potential synergies around data onboarding. Um, for, I think this is supposed to be boosting SP success, um, some really great action items coming out of that. Um, some FIP discussions being proposed around um, making worker addresses only responsible for block signing, um, some new SP implementations uh, and improvements that should make them more interchangeable, um, some work that the StoreSwift team is going to take on to make a uh, pre-commit one, um, make it easier to reseal unsealed sectors, um, which will uh, save save overhead costs for storage providers, and some good discussion around non-interactive PoRep and the concept 
of ice cube sectors um, that can be um, kind of like deposited from your uh, ice machine and then loaded into the network at a later time. Um, and some, some pretty interesting ideas about how that could make the ceiling as a service and SP bottlenecks a lot more efficient. Um, in the governance and build plus track, um, we talked about the need for more data cap allocator programs that we can trial and measure and tune um, and you know start depositing data cap to then be reallocated by many different systems within the fill plus um, program and that can tune for different client needs, um, different data types, um, everything that meets our um, you know, unified uh, definition of all of humanity's uh, information um, that we want to be stored in Filecoin that can um, you know, adapt these programs for different constraints. Um, and there was also some discussion around the new FIP001 v2 um, proposal um, with uh, some changes to kind of how uh, having a community guild, maybe some on-chain voting, um, maybe some ways of measuring R&D investment so that we can make sure that we're continuing to involve the FIP process, especially for things that kind of get deadlocked in um, kind of community debate right now um, in order to help make that process have an endpoint or at least be more clear about <laughs> how our uh, um, community governance works in those contexts. Um, and finally, the IPC roadmap had uh, a lot of excitement um, for faster block time and also uh, folks who are excited to use the Mycelium L2 um, network that the IPC team will be spinning up um, so that folks can take advantage of faster block time there. And that was exciting for a number of groups outside of the original IPC subnet builders who also want to take advantage of some of the opportunities there. Um, and I don't have a slide on this, but call to action. If you're excited by these things and you want to be um, engaging, join us in Iceland, um, phildev.io, um, for our part two of the PhilDev Summit. Um, we'll be talking about these issues a lot more, and we're going to be working to um, build a community roadmap of what our various different teams going to be contributing to make Filecoin stronger and better um, and more capable as we look into 2024. Um, and so... Uh, bring bring your ideas of important upgrades that uh, should be worked on and actively prioritized as well. And um, on Wednesday afternoon, we'll be doing a great session on that. All right. Well, thank you all for being a part of this, sharing exciting updates, and excited to see a number of you in person next week. Cheers, all. Cheers.